Yes. Uh, recording it. Okay. So anyway, Helen Stevens was missing. Nothing new. So I said, you know, you've overlooked Helen Stevens. Who is Helen Stevens? She said, she's the only Missouri's only double gold Olympian from Fulton, Missouri. And she said, well, why don't you write her too? Open mouth, insert foot. <clears throat> so that's how I got started. And I, um, then I subsequently wrote a few others for the second volume because it was a very successful fundraiser for the AUW. So then what? You have another question for me or shall I proceed? No, you go ahead, go ahead. Well, I thought what I would do is uh, read, uh, this is very self-promoting, but I'm going to read um, what, what there really is about Helen. It's on the back of the book. And by the way, the book, I think um, CC's has book, books of this, this book uh, for $10 and it, the proceeds goes to the library. So, that downtown book, yeah. yeah. has a lot of good pictures in it. Anyway, for those of you who like nonfiction, that's a misnomer. Um, <laughs> anyway, I won't talk about that. I promise I won't. This is uh, something that um, was a review, a very short one. And it gives you a summation of what Helen was about. Olympic gold medalist of 1930s, multi-sports athlete, brash, cocky, and controversial. Sounds like baby, Babe Diedrichson? No. Missouri farm girl Helen Stevens shares some characteristics with her idol, but she never matched, but, uh, matched Babe's fame until later. Authorized biographer Hansen, a local Missouri freelance writer, interviewed Stevens before her death in 94 and accessed her huge memorabilia collection. Wisely, she focuses on Stevens' 36 Olympic diaries, providing a teenager's matchless view of the historic miss, myth shrouded Berlin Games. After winning gold medal in the four by 100 relay and the world record setting 100, she got Hitler's autograph and was invited to his headquarters. She declined and endured a bizarre pass. If you know what it is to have a guy make a pass at, you know, you know what he did. He filled her up, or felt her up rather. Uh, a pass from him and from Goring, which she also declined. Adulated back home, she saw the living in sports, giving exhibitions, barnstorming with her own basketball team, and advocating for women's sports all her life. Although the story's pure drama declines after Helen's mm -hmm. Olympic heights, Hanson has served her story well. This is recommended for women's studies, history collections, and gay studies in college libraries, and for larger public libraries. That was what Library Journal wrote when it came out. Oh, oh, yeah, that's very good. Yeah, I didn't know that. And there's really a real uh, Bob Costas, who is a, a sports writer, say, was that St. Louis sports writer? Knew her has well. a, yeah, has a really wonderful uh, review on the back of the book. And it says Helen Stevens story touches so many of the big moments and emerging issues of American sports in the 1930s and 40s. Her life was rich with adventure, controversy and accomplishment. More people should be familiar with the Fulton Flash. And now, thanks to Sharon Kenny Hansen's carefully researched biography, they will be. But that was really a nice, a nice tribute. So. Well, it was. But he knew her. And um, so I, I think he did a good job because it really does tell pretty much in sum what Helen was all about. <clears throat> she still isn't well known. But there is this uh, sports complex on William Woods College campus, you know with her name on it and she had contributed money to the school for that purpose even though they took away her scholarship once they the scandal broke you know after the olympics i suppose you're supposed to ask about the scandal right yes uh, yes uh, do you tell. About the scandal? well when she beat the world uh 100 meter relayer uh runner stella walsh we have your bicycle, never mind, and ride to Albuquerque and meet us there. <clears throat> but what's that? Um, I was looking where South, where Alaska Airlines flies nonstop, and that's one of the spots. But um, oh no, you know we we were just kind of kicking around a, a way to do that with you two, which would be really fun. Was this some kind of a bomb? This is. This is. What about this person? Let's mute him. Yeah, mute them all. There was somebody who wasn't muted. 
funny thing. There was one of our participants not muted. Not nice. So anyway, sorry, Sharon. Please tell know. us about the scandal. The scandal. <laughs> I'm glad we didn't have a scandal tonight. <laughs> um, tell us about Helen's. Yeah. Well, the whole thing of it is she lost her scholarship because the, supposedly the Polish press said that she was a man running as disguised as a woman. And uh, unfortunately, well, fortunately, I guess, uh, Look Magazine picked that up and said, did a, did a spread of all the sportswomen of that time because they really didn't want them in the sports, any sports, but you know, track and field was the creme de la creme of uh, the Olympics. But anyway, they didn't want women in, so they slurred them. And with Helen, it was under her picture where she's running, is this a man or a woman? So Helen sued. And, but when she got back home, it didn't set well in very conservative uh, William Woods College at that time, which she had earned, you know, and Coach Moore had helped her get because she had shown early promise with her speed and sprinting. So anyway, they, the uh, president of the college said, uh, we can't have this scandal, you have to leave the school. And so she packed her bags and um, headed home, called her mother, told her, come and get me. And her mother, who was a William Woods grad, you didn't know this, Madeline? No. Yeah, her, her mother said, Helen, um, gold medals might open some, might." open some doors for you, but an education will keep them open. You're going to go back to school some, some, somehow, some way. And they, they were poor. So uh, she took jobs off campus. They made her leave campus. Of course, she couldn't have her campus room. And uh, she lived off campus and um, took a job as a, she was, she was a very big girl, so she could uh, deliver large trunks to boxes to and from she also got a job as a librarian, which served her very well in the library. And so she was able to finish her education. But can you imagine an 18 year old girl going back home and having somebody say this of you? When it was a time, you know, when, and actually there was a German, there was a German uh, runner guy, a doctor who disguised himself as a woman to spy and was on, on the team. You have to read the book to know this stuff. You know, <laughs> that's wow. why that's why I write nonfiction. I write the facts. I don't write uh, novels. I write. I I want to know how people live. I want to know who they are and what they had to live through, and how they they got past it. How they how they uh, managed to continue and not get defeated. And cer she certainly didn't get defeated. She sued Look Magazine, won five thousand dollars which helped her establish her all-American co-eds basketball team. Yeah, that's, so she had, you know, it wasn't just the Olympics, although that was obviously a huge accomplishment, but she was involved in sports the rest of her life. Yes, she right? was, yes, yeah. 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 She promoted sports for young girls and she uh, nominated her uh, teammates for Halls of Fame because she was one of the first, she was the first woman to be placed in the Hall of Fame, Sports Hall of Fame. <clears throat> and then she, as a, as a member, then she could nominate uh, women. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> you have to do things that way. Could yeah. we together. So you have, Anna, you wanted to ask me a few questions? Else? Yeah, yeah. Um, did you leave out anything from your research that you yeah, that, that you wanted to have in the book that you know that didn't make it well yeah i did um i was very unhappy with the press it was university press that uh, cut the uh, index because any scholar needs that and i uh i have one i had one made and paid someone to do it and they also cut the first chapter out um yeah madeline you did that for me <laughs> Thank you very much. what's that Oh. The index did that. I didn't know if you wanted me to brag on you or not, but thank you. Because um, it's essential for other, other uh, researchers to know. Um, so then the first chapter that I wrote, they cut, which was, it was a chapter of the history of the women before Helen Stevens came in 1936. It included Dee Beckman, who later became the first woman uh, Olympic coach in track and field, and she's from St. Louis. And she was a uh, 1928, uh, sprinter and a fencer who was a winner 
their gold medal winner of her field. And of course, the two first two black women in 1932 uh, were in that history. And of course, Babe Diedrichson. And let's see, that takes us to 36. But there were others I mentioned. I wanted to do a thorough sweep, find as many women who had tried to get into the Olympics, which were really, it was difficult. The American women did not want, the American Women's Athletic Association did not want women in sports. Europeans were far more advanced and they had a head start and they were allowed in, but. What was the reason? I mean, the usual kind of reason that women should be, what, you know, home? <laughs> delicate and uh, it would hurt their opportunity, their chances for having children. And uh, I, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to step away from my camera for a minute and show you what I think it's all about. I think it's all about this. Norman Rockwell, okay? These boys are afraid that that little girl is gonna take away all their marbles. <laughs> okay. So they didn't women, if they would compete against a woman, by God, and the woman won, how Heaven embarrassing. Heaven forbid. Yeah. Well, guess, what? guess what? Helen ran against Jesse Owens. And one time she tied him and broke her finger when she was going across the, uh, um, the line. The really? Line. Yes. Huh. But to make money, they did spec. You know, they did uh, these exhibitions. And Jesse Owens needed to make money. He ended up being in the cleaning business because nobody would hire him because he was black. And so uh, he did a number of things. And exhibition races were won. Did they remain close over the years? You know, as Helen was the self. She volunteered to be the social secretary of the Midwest Olympians, and so she kept in touch with. Her. Oh. Very sociable, and um, she, uh, she 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 was also very friendly. And I compare her to Will Rogers. She was an able, and I've seen this happen many many times when we were traveling together. She would strike up a conversation, and pretty soon she'd find some kind of connection that they had, either a relationship far distant, or association, or an event. She could have been a great politician. Hmm. During the war, what did she do during the war? Well, um, she uh, worked for uh, Curtis Wright. You know, they became McDonnell Douglas as a Rosie mm -hmm. the Riveter type person. Um, she did those exhibitions. She was clerking at different places. She, there were industrial leagues that wanted women to provide exercise for the working women in these factories. So she would, uh, organized programs for for athletes, mostly basketball, because she was, the, you know, she started her basketball team in 30, don't, uh, my memory's failing me, I think, let's see, 30, 38 season, but 37, she were, she joined the All-American Redheads out of uh, Cassville, Missouri, and uh, learned a little bit about the business, was their star player. Of course, everybody wanted her to be, uh, they part of her team. But anyway, she worked for the Redheads. And then Abe Saperstein told her to name her team with that 5,000 she won with her lawsuit, uh, the Helen Stevens All-American Redheads. And they, they ran all over the country and Canada and Mexico playing men's against men's teams. Mm -hmm. All women team. It was, you know, it was a, a shtick that they did, but they would win. They won over 50% of the time. These were, were uh, women who were, some were aviators, different types of athletic women that got together. Why basketball? I mean, as opposed to some other sport, you know. Why basketball? I don't know. Yeah. That's a good hmm. question. Why did she choose it? She played, she bowled, she golfed. Uh, I don't know, everything that, that appealed to her, she would try and excel in. Yeah. Yeah. Did she complete her education at, yes. uh, she did? Her mother insisted, of course, and Helen wanted it. Um, yeah. no. But when that happened, it really uh, turned her away. She did not go to her alum class or alum reunions for quite a while. Yeah. But Helen was not a person of a bitter person. Over time, she would, she started going back and, and they embraced her and she started helping. She helped her niece get through college there. She helped pay there. Um, 
I, I just can't, I mean, yeah, she was a terrific athlete, but she was also an incredibly good person. She kept friends with her, uh, she made friends in high school with Julia. She called her Julia, Julia. And they were, you know, the odds country girls out. So they weren't the popular ones, but Julia ended up living in, uh, and she's deceased now, uh, government housing and broke her television or something went wrong. And Helen would show up at Julia's house with a new television. Would never, I would have never known that if Julia hadn't told me that. Helen never told me that. Mm-hmm. She didn't tell me she contributed her money to the William Woods for the sports complex. She didn't tell me that she put her cousin, her niece through school. I had to dig and find information about that. She was not a braggart. She was just a, a friendly, good old country girl who she could, she was very articulate. She loved English and history and uh, she could speak with a country person very easily and slip right in. It's like, like and speak I, of, I remember in Fast Girls, they mentioned that she had read Mein Kampf and all the other girls who were on the team were surprised that she did, or she had, you know. When Helen so. told me that, I, I, I doubted it. I said, I, you know, high school girl reading Mein Kampf, come on. I, so you don't I believe, okay. Was there anything in English, translated in English in the 30s during her era that was available in this country? And I found that there was, so then I included it. But I was not going to write that in there unless I could verify that. And so there you are. Huh. Right. She's very clever. Yeah. Did you, did you, uh, how do you feel about how she was portrayed in the book Fast Girls? I was disappointed in most of it because uh, a lot, I mean, for instance, uh, R. Lee, her brother, her little brother was called R. Lee. And, and there, it's an explanation for that. But he's called Bob Lee. He was never called Bob Lee. Maybe somebody did, but she, uh, Elise would have had to know somebody who, who knew somebody. And all those people are dead now. Hmm. But no, I don't read fiction. I want to know, here's my question. Here's the question of the day. How do, does a person know the character of another person? How do you know the, the character of a celebrity? What kind of propaganda or what kind of news releases do they put out? Uh, how can one truly know what a relationship is, an interrelationship is with someone else? You have to do some research. You can't just make this stuff up. Now, there was a time in interviewing he- Helen, you know, I'd go from Jeff City every week with something I'd written and have her look it over and say, is this right? Got to get that right. Um, but anyway, I'm losing the track here. I'm losing the track. Oh, one time I would ask her a question because I, uh, I wanted to explore something. And she'd say, oh, I don't know, I don't know. So I'd, as a journalist, as a writer, I'd ask her the same kind of question a little bit later and in a little different way. And she said, I just don't know, I can't, I can't remember. And I'd press and I'd press. And then one day she said, oh, make something up. And that was just horrible for me to hear. <laughs> I'm just, no, you can't just make something up. So she had a good sense of humor, but I don't know. I was always called the serious one in school. And I read, I read all, all the biographies I could in that little, maybe Claudia knows the, uh, the series. I'd love to know what that series was called. They were all orange and they were all biographies. Uh, Betsy Ross, the... Um, Oh, well, you just, you could, I want to find that just because I want to do a little nostalgic visiting. I, I think I've told you how popular historical fiction is these I days, and, and yeah. that um, didn't necessarily impress you. <laughs> <laughs> I want facts. I think it's been really messed up. We don't know what's true and what's not true anymore. We got, how can you have a fake fact? A fact is a fact. <laughs> and it should be verifiable, and you should think about what you read. My mother told me, don't believe everything you read. Check it out. And she also told me, never a liar or a thief. Never be a liar or a thief. I wanted her love. I was never going to be a liar or a thief. Therefore, I had to be a nonfiction writer. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> how, how do you think Helen would regard your book? Would oh, she? She would be so thrilled. She never thought anybody would write her story. 
Her housekeeper was threatening to throw all her memorabilia away in a black bag. I arrived at the right time and saved it and was able to get a person to help archive it and get it in a proper archival place. And she was so grateful for that. But she would have been thrilled because now the documentation is there. It's not just loosely about in newspapers here and there and journals or stories told by people. It, there, I feel very confident that there, there aren't any lies in my book, that everything that I wrote can be verified. And if, and I've got footnotes to show you. And I had hundreds of interviews all taped. And I had my friends over at Stevens College, they, they transfer, uh, transferred the cassette tapes into D, a CD. And who knows what it'll have to be transferred into next. But anyway, those interviews are safe, as are those interviews with Lenny Riefenstahl. I know you're going to do a program on Lenny. And I met her too. You know. well, we showed the film, we showed part of the film Olympia uh, about a week and a half ago because, you know, it relates to Certainly you know, Fast Girl, <laughs> for sure. And it relates to how I ended up talking with Helen because Helen was given an award at uh, William Woods. Uh, on an honor or something, and one of my students invited me to go to this supper, this annual supper, in the middle of winter. And I knew I had to have an opening line because she's always surrounded by people who wanted to meet her or talk to her and everything. And I had written my uh, a paper in, in grad school on Lenny Riefenstahl because I wanted to be at one time a, a filmmaker, a script writer. And uh, I was interested in women uh, filmmakers, and she was the women, woman to, to know about. So I went over to the University of, well, I said to Helen, did you meet Riefenstahl when you were in, in, uh, in the Olympics? She said, oh yeah, she was a gorgeous woman. And uh, we talked about that. But uh, I was able to talk to Lenny Riefenstahl after I raised my brothers. I went over to Germany, and I'd written uh, in English, a letter to her, went over and talked to Dolph Schrader, would you please translate this in German because I speak no German. You remember, Madeline, you and I took a German class at night once, one class. And then I headed off for Germany and I met her and uh, asked her about her right. You know, I told her, I said, are you going to write your memoir? So I have no time. I have no time. It's the same thing Helen said to me when she asked me to write her book. I don't have time. I'm always over here. I'm traveling here. Just give me a talk here. You write it. And I'd only written five pages in that AAUW book. I had never written a full life biography before. I'd written articles, all kinds of articles, editorials, journals, all kinds of other stuff. I made a living as a writer, as a Ghost writer for a banker and a ghost writer for actually for Janae Barnett, who was the first woman president of William Woods. I drafted her uh, inaugural. Of course, it you know, this is the draft, but that's the kind of thing I did to make a living plus teaching. Um, there, there was a legal case involved in this book too, right? Do, the, do you want to talk about that or? Yeah, there was. Um, actually, there were two legal issues associated. That's what could have been written about after the, this one was out, but I'm writing another one. I'm not cool with it. <clears throat> I promised Helen that, and when I give a promise, I keep a promise. I can. I promised Helen that I would uh, make sure that her archives would be protected in a proper place. And, um, but I had, St. Martin's Press was interested in the, the manuscript initially after I had most of it written. And when her brother, who was, I assess him as being very materialistic, found out about that, he wanted a percentage from that book sales. And he was not even at all interested in the fact that I was writing her biography. He thought she was still living in the past. So I said- You no. said they had kind of a fractious relationship, sort yeah, of? They, yeah. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I said, no, Helen, we had an agreement and a written agreement that I would do this all this work on speculation because I believe this is women's history and it needs to be out. And of course I was married and I was subsidized by my husband and I was teaching. I don't need the money and I didn't do it for the money. So when he said that, I said, she, well, Helen called me and said, we need to talk about this. And I said, no, Helen, that wasn't our agreement. And so uh, he was thinking about suing me then. After she died, he sued me 
for all of the archival material that she had allowed me to go through. I go over to her house every week, give her what I'd written, pick a box of her stuff, working with Pam um, Miner, who is a professional archivist, to properly organize it, and then to place it with the State Historical Society. He wanted all that back. Well, he did get the gold medals. I never had them in my possession anyway, Helen didn't. That was, you look at them, yeah, you don't need them, but you need paperwork to do the story. And the diary of five chapters of my book or ba have some excerpts from the di uh, her diary that, um, that um, you know, explicate what she was doing over in Berlin. So anyway, he wanted all that back. And I refused and uh, went through several attorneys. T they tell me, families always win. I said, but I had a written contract with Helen. This is what two of them, that I would be her archivist and so on. Anyway, I won because I'm stubborn and I made a promise to her. And so the, I agreed with the attorney. I said, she, Bob can have the diary as long as he's alive, but you can't cut it in half and divide it between his two children. She wanted it up there. That's why it's in my possession. So I feel good about that, you know? And I know oh, all, all of her, all of the archives are at the State Historical Society, correct? Yeah, and some of her, some things I understand, some of her family, some of her cousins or whatever, nephews, niece, not nephews, nieces, I think, uh, and maybe her sister-in-law was still living. Maybe they put some things in after I had already deposited everything that I had. Now, my letters to and from Helen, those are my possession. And when I die, they get to go. But, you know, the issue about the lawsuit, it was in our correspondence as well hmm. as for well. that's That's the past. It's, who, what was it, um, Michelle Obama said, when they go low, I go high? <laughs> right. I know when this, uh, the State Historical Society's uh, building opened, you know, during the open house, there was a display, a really nice display of Helen's uh, shoes and, you know, a program from the 36 Olympics and just a lot of other things in a, a glass case. It was very interesting. So. There's also some of her memorabilia in Springfield mm -hmm. where there's an exhibit of her um, tangible, not so much the paperwork. Mm -hmm. um, but William Woods had quite a bit of stuff too. They they had a case, and uh, mostly trophies. What would I do with trophies? You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But anyway, I do have correspondence between myself and Riefenstahl, which is kind of uh, interesting too. Will you show us? And you have some photos that you wanted to show I'll try. that I think that I think people would be interested in and seeing. Okay, I can give you a choice. Uh, you would, would you like to see her as a greenie from the sticks? Oh, yes. <laughs> or with Dizzy, uh, Diz, Dizzy Dean. Um, again, let me see, where is this one? Uh, here we go. Let me see if I can do this right. Uh, share screen. There. We can, can see it. Yes. Yeah, yes. yeah, that's good. That was when uh, she was. She looks determined. School. She looks very determined. <laughs> she was in high school then, <clears throat> and Coach Moore uh, discovered her her speed by uh, tracking her. They there were some girls who were very fast on the Methodist girls basketball team. You asked about basketball earlier, and uh, so Coach Moore lined her up. Um, up, lined her up with a few other girls, and she ran and beat the then uh, American girls 50 yard dash record, tied it, she tied it twice. He made her run it twice because he couldn't believe it. This untrained girl ran that fast. Hmm. Did she remain close with Coach Moore throughout her life? Oh yeah, I, I, I talked and interviewed him too. They, they, she stayed in touch with all of her friends. That's the other thing that I like about her. Like yeah. Louise Stokes and Tidy and all, all well, of them? Louise Stokes has kind of disappeared. I don't know what Elise has uh, found out about her, if anything. But Tidy Pickett, there was more about her, but they, they just sort of disappeared, uh, at least in our history, our white history. I know that mm -hmm. it's available in the black newspapers covered it. 
but uh, I didn't pursue it. I did do some my biographical sketch of each of those women when um, I did the film proposal, which I think I told you there's going to be a film about her being done by two wonderful women filmmakers. It's halfway through. Oh, you might talk about that a little bit. That's, that's something that's in development or? Yes, yes. Uh, and again, uh, I, I gave that uh, copyright to them. They can do whatever they want with it because I trust these two women. They're very good um, filmmakers. They, I looked at their history of the works they've already done. They're with Stevens College and the pandemic has kind of put a halt on it all, but uh, I'm convinced that they're going to finish it. <clears throat> so, hmm. I approached uh, Steph Borklin and um, Terry Yost a couple of years, two or three years ago when we wrote up a contract. And then this year, I just decided to give them the whole shebang. That I don't want to be a, a part of it. I mean, let mm -hmm. them do their thing. Let them do their thing. They'll be they'll honor her well. Mm -hmm. That's good. Now, now, was Helen perfect? That's the question. I don't think so. Everyone has a flaw. Um, she smoked like a, well, what do they say, a chimney, mm -hmm. and she liked her booze. And uh, she liked she liked to joke. For instance, the night after we had this, the book signing for the AAUW um, public, publication, she came into uh, Columbia, the library here, and signed books. And then it was a rainy night, <clears throat> and she said to me, "I'm not sure I know how to get back to uh, Highway such and such." So I said, "All right, I'll lead you, and then you go left, and I'll go right." But then she said, well, let's stop over here at this. Uh, I got her into Fulton. I fought, went all the way into Fulton. She stopped at a, uh, the, the motel where she was staying before she went back to St. Louis and offered me a drink. So I had a drink with her, but I did not drink very much because I don't drink and drive. And that's the, that's the setting which she says that I got her drunk. And it was the other way around. <laughs> and agreed then to do her book because I didn't think I, I could I could take it on. I was busy teaching and so forth. But you can't yeah. resist you can't resist a person who's bigger than life like that. Yeah. But she had fun with me. She 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 had fun, I think no because I was her, her straight person, you know. She was the in a way. <laughs> I don't know if I'm explaining it or not. Yeah. Yes, you are. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think her legacy is? Well, she predicted that if black women were given the chance, they would excel and they have. And her legacy is that she did promote that. She, uh, Jackie Joyner Kersey, East St. Louis girl from my hometown, uh, was in an audience with Helen when she was giving one of her programs. And, uh, I just think that she opened the door for so many women to, tr to be more athletic, uh, to face the slings and arrows thrown at you with uh, uh, either a, a challenge back as with that suit, lawsuit, or just to you know, make joke of it or just ignore it or go on or talk about it even, but you know, not ignore it, not deny it, just go on. Mm -hmm. She, she, um, she was a closeted gay woman, and oh, I, I should tell you this is an important story. How did she? Why did she choose me? Well, she had invited me down to talk about uh, doing the biography. Of course, I had my brothers there, my brother Jeff is there, and friends there, and so I go in there to see her, and then I was going to go see my brother, so she took me downstairs to see some stuff she said she kept it I have if you know you if you write this book you've got all this you can have and look at and use and it's practically written sure so she showed me the look magazine first thing is this a man or a woman I said so what you know uh and I didn't even know she was gay and it just doesn't matter to me I have I have gay friends who cares it's their business not mine how can you tell somebody who to love Anyway, I later learned she was gay and didn't matter, but she was testing me, you know, am I real? That, she would always say, are you real? Yeah, I'm real. This is it. This is all you get. <laughs> and she was the same way. So I think we were a good match in that sense. 
she had a mate of 40 years and that's the and i wanted to include mabel in this but how did not, they meet excuse me how did they meet mabel was her supervisor at the defense mapping agency when she was a librarian and so uh they became acquainted and mabel ended up being her booker she was still uh, running uh the olympic co-eds at that time prior to the war and then after the war you know was was put on hold during world war ii but uh mabel had just died a couple of years before i met helen and she was at a low and she had also broken her foot and she thought that was it and so then here comes sharon hansen you know look at her book and she write her book and so i think i helped her in that way gave her something but she was still going to be on the podium encouraging women and um giving her talks well she was involved in senior olympics too right i forgot all about that how could yeah I that's from the very beginning yeah she that's fairly new that was a fairly new thing the senior olympics national yeah. and the yeah. show eight games she was the torch runner for both of those but she was uh because she was a double gold olympian she had you know a command of of the interest in these programs and promoted these programs from the very beginning and of course competed in these programs and when she'd show up on the field i even heard i heard this they'd show up and richard was with me my husband was with me um oh there's helen stevens we might as well not even try you know not because she's <laughs> going to win because if you look at her records on both those senior games that she competed in and in the discus or the javelin or the, or the track running in the rain even i have pictures of her running in the rain and, and winning she would she would win 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 and she told me she said nobody remembers who what came in second you've got to win <laughs> yeah. right so you have more pictures to show yeah us. you have some more pictures that you can show i'll do them fast okay if i can let me do the share thing there she is when she's trying to make some money can you see that uh-huh all right oh the oh the, the i'll show you so that's how she made money there there are those exceptional girls that ones that uh, ava tricks one's a star on skis one's a lady wrestler one's a i don't know i can't read the small print but the uh, horse <laughs> racer, uh, horse woman um there's another runner <coughs> there's a basketball so anyway she chose people who were athletic and um who else um well, I don't know what to show you. Here's the redheads. I'll show you that. This is what, was right she a redhead? Now. No, they all. This guy down in in Cassville had all his his girls dye their hair red because his wife was a beautician. So they all had, that was their shtick. You had to have a shtick to get attention. So mm -hmm. Helen had her hair dyed red and became an All American redhead <coughs> basketball. But look at MGM. She ran there. And this was in 37. This is before she started her own team. Let's see what else I can give you. That would be interesting. Uh, let's see. Here are the relayers. The, the, pic, the picture with Hitler, you know. Well, oh, that's in the, that's in, uh, that's in um, Elise's book as well. This is uh, Betty. Oh, that's a, good, that's a good photo. That's Harriet. That's uh, the, Beckman's protege, and this is Annette. They won the uh, relay. It was an interesting story. Uh, let's see. So Helen was what six feet tall? Oh, I was probably about that. Here, here she is. Um, let me see if I can get this. Here she is, uh, <laughs> promoting oh. Quaker Oats. <laughs> That's a good picture. That's great. Yeah. There's a little, there's that scar on her head that, you know, talk about vanity. When mm -hmm. she was a senior, she had it removed. I, I don't know why she waited so long, but it always bothered her. Oh. Yeah, she, she was. Oh, uh, it's larger than I thought. Oh, mm -hmm. it was large, yeah. Oh. During the war, she was the Rosie the Riveter, at, as I told you. This is mm -hmm. at the uh, Curtis Wright, which became McDonnell Douglas. And uh, this is Robert. That's. Yeah, he went. He was in the service. And nothing showing. Nothing showing up. Oh, here we go. Here we go. 
Thank you for telling me. Good looking young man. That's he was in the service, but he always told Helen, you were over there having a good time and I was in there saving the world for democracy. He was a bit jealous. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. And so she joined, oops. Okay, I mean, this isn't working so well. Um, I, I'm not fast at it. Here she is uh, signing on for the Marines. She didn't get it. Uh, she enlisted, but she didn't serve. The war was over in a couple of months. Um, I told you about the cartoons, didn't I? That she did when she worked at the Defense Mapping Agency. We about ready to wind up? No, I, well, yeah. She drew cartoons all the time when she was working for the uh, Defense Mapping Agency of her, of her boss, Charles Gunther, who was an internationally known translator of poetry and he and she smoked like a chimney as i said and so she's always making fun of the what she called the curly big wigs mm. let's <clears throat> it was all it was interesting to me and i know everyone people smoked back then but all the sports all the athletes who smoked that was just you know surprising um, and drink um here she is at back at william woods she wanted to get uh, I think enough money for her uh, retirement. So she worked a couple of years there. And she's a, a double gold Olympian, but is she in charge of this girls uh, track team? No, the guy is. Mm -hmm. That was in the 70s when, you know, women were trying to get equality of uh, pay. Uh, let's see. This is an, uh, when she got off the, um, the ship. Oops, I have to, again, again, I have to show the it. The title of her talk. Oh, we have a question. We have a question from someone and it says the title is unusual. Can you tell us more about what went into your decision to choose this title for the book? And I'm thinking maybe she means the title of this program, perhaps? Liar and Thief. That was the title of this particular program. Oh. We, because right? if you if you mean the book, she was Helen was known as the Fulton Flash, so yeah, because she was born in Fulton, Missouri. Yeah. yeah, but I'm thinking that you meant yes, she wants to know about the program. The program the title, title, the liar and thief thing. What what well, what's the significance mother, of that? My mother used to tell me never be a liar or a thief. Okay, and there are liars and thieves among us, and um, I saw all these attempts to take her archives from her and you know to to sell maybe the diary uh he got the autograph book which is, would be amazingly i don't have any idea what in the world that would have been that she kept autographs of all these people that she met but anyway he tried he sued me and uh, i think he's just trying to steal well she can say that because he's dead if, if he were alive i'd get sued again but anyway, he put me through the, it stopped, it stopped the production of the book. Uh, no, no publisher would talk to you when, when you're in litigation. Hmm. And uh, so that really was a down time for me. But when I settled, I settled, you can have the book, you can have the diary. You can't cut it in half and give it half to your niece, the other half to your niece, your daughter rather, or nieces. Because Helen wanted that diary in the archive. When you die, if you will give it to the archives as she wanted, I will, I will concede. So that's how we ended it. He died within a year. And the diary is saved and preserved at the state archives. So, I mean, um, the lawsuit, um, that's what I'm talking about. Also, <clears throat> St. Martin's Press wanted it and R. Lee wanted a percentage and was thinking of suing me to get it. But I had a contract with Helen, so. Yeah. Does that explain Whatever. it? Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Whatever you're doing right now, the volume is perfect oh, right great. this minute. <laughs> don't change. I, I changed. know. I don't know, but one of the uh, participants said that, you know, it was hard to hear too, so uh, I don't know. There are times when it's been really, really good. Yeah. And, and other times when it's been less so, but oh, yeah. 
overall, yeah, yeah, I think it's been okay. I see that my sister in law is in the audience. Can she ask me a question? Sure, of course. Well, maybe she needs to write it. I don't know. Where, where is she? I will speak up. Oh, okay, <laughs> sure, yes. yes, go ahead. <laughs> um. I'm trying to think of a good question though, Sharon, you caught me off guard. Um, is this your favorite topic of all the people that you've written about? Athletics? The, no, the, the individual. No, I guess my favorite concept would be I'm interested in women's history. We've done so much and we've give, been given so little space mm -hmm. and print and what and that's why I'm so adamant about nonfiction. It's got to be the truth. It's got, you've got to tell what we did. Mm -hmm. Don't put any fluff in it. There's plenty of, of wonderful strength and change that we've created and made this country. And Helen was not, Helen was not prejudiced either against black people. Well, maybe she was for her time, but her father hired black people for $5 a day the way Ford did. And so she was acquainted with black people. And because she was persecuted as a, a gay person and was a, a country person, country bumpkin is how the city kids, because she went to Fulton High. She was not popular until she showed herself. You know, she put Fulton on the map before Winston Churchill. She, mm -hmm. <laughs> Winston Churchill, of course, continued it. But uh, yeah, it's women's history that drives me because I think our time is due. And Sharon, Sharon, I wanted to clarify something you said earlier with regard to the scandal. I understand that she was temporarily kicked out of William Woods or only um, as much as she couldn't live there. Uh, you mentioned she moved off campus so she could still go to school, but she couldn't live there. I, was, I wasn't quite clear on that. The Woodsies, they could live on, on campus. And then there were those who could live off campus. Her scholarships, her yearly tuition was removed from her. And she, okay. could, not have, she could not have a room. She had to live off campus. She was, she was uh, untouchable. But okay. She, but, but they conceded that she could finish her education that way. If she could come up with the money, they probably thought she couldn't. Mm -hmm. Because of the scandals, national, not national, international. Remember, it came from Europe. Supposedly. I think that would have been extremely difficult to want to continue to attend that school after, yeah, after after they did that. Yeah, after they kind of turned up their nose at her. Yeah. Well, she did have her clique of friends, and they're loyal. But still, she you no, know, she was her mother's daughter. She was very close with her, and she was going to do what her mother wanted. Her father wanted her to go and work in the shoe factory, come mm -hmm. home and work on the farm. He had no ambition for her. Okay. Her Thank you. Her sons, yeah. Thank you for clarifying that. I didn't uh, okay. quite understand um, yeah. how that how that worked. Yeah. So, uh, would, are there other people who'd like to ask questions? Yeah. Would yes. you like to either type them in and we'll read them to Sharon or unmute and ask? Sharon, this is Jennifer. Hi, Jennifer. And, uh, hi. Hey. Wonderful job. Oh, thank you. Um, I did want to just say something, and this is back when I was going to nursing school, so a long time ago, and I remember how hard you were working on all of this, and I remember, too, the passion that you showed towards Helen, and that you deeply cared for her, I did. and mm -hmm. I was very impressed with that, so I, I'm glad everything's come to fruition I feel bad about some of the negative things that happened prior to the conclusion, but I think you're amazing. Thank you, my dear. Thank you're you. welcome. I, I, I feel validated. Thank you. <laughs> you are so wonderful. I don't, know, I don't really think it's so much, but it's nice to hear. Thank you. Well, that's what I think. I love you. Thank you. I love you too. <laughs> I do remember seeing all the boxes and boxes of files and papers at your house while you were working on this. I mean, just huge amounts of paper. It was pretty intimidating stuff. 
let's give Pam Miner her due. She did that free. The she archivist. Yeah. yeah. She was from William Woods and she was her sister, but she didn't know her. And she was also a track, she ran track. But then there's a Laura Malzner who also helped me write out item for item. Once we got them organized and categorized in files, then um, Laura helped me enter on, because uh, I wanted to make sure if I took those things over there, and this is me, and I gave them away to the archives, they better still be there. And I would know because I have the list. You see what I mean? Yeah. People, these are valuable things. Um, I certainly think that diary is valuable, but the manifesto, we forgot to talk about the, the uh, Hitler manifesto. Oh, Elise go ahead. It, Elise got it wrong. I have to say, Elise, my friend, when I hope you're watching, maybe you're not. Um, Helen told me she got the a manifesto, all the girls, all the women got manifestos in their, um, what do you call them, dorm rooms. And they didn't keep the doors locked. They wouldn't allow, to, allow them to keep the doors locked. So that anybody could go in and slip in the, anything or take anything. So anyway, she got it there at Berlin and she didn't get, now maybe it was distributed in the United States before because there was this America First thing going on. And um, I think it was FDR, was it right? He voted, he, he said, yes, there will not be a boycott. You will go, your girls will go. Right. There was a question of getting money for the women. There was plenty of money for the men, but yet the women had to raise their own $500. And I got a stamp here of Helen, I could show it to you, that was um, uh, sold <clears throat> to help raise some money for Helen. I, I think I've got it in among here. Uh, I can talk and uh, answer other questions while I look, I think. <laughs> there it is, yeah. This was sold, uh, let me do the share. That stamp was sold. Uh, I don't know how much, and people would buy it just because they they were having, they hoped that she would become uh, an Olympic. Um, and they had they you know they had good reason to believe that she would win or come come in second. <laughs> anyway, they had to raise money, and she gave talks all the time to, to among the Rotary people and everything, saying what she hoped to do. The boys team at Westminster and at the high school all got behind her, but she practiced with them. She got uh, the superintendent allowed um, Coach Moore to practice Helen at, with the boys team. Boy, they didn't, you know, they did not like that because they didn't always beat her. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Well, but, Coach Moore was pretty amazing for his time too. You know, I think you know to see her, her potential. Mm. The other thing I'd like to say is, you know, this term about being a good sport. She was a good sport. She, if she lost, you know, you have to shake hands and congratulate. And that's what she did. I don't know if I have that picture of her shaking hands with Stella Walsh, but after the, she beat the world champion, she went across the field and shook her hand. And over time, they became acquainted because they'd meet at different con conferences. But um, it, she, she never lost. <laughs> so she didn't, didn't know what it felt like to lose, but she was a good uh, winner too. Mm -hmm. Good sportsman, sportswoman. Well, before we close, <clears throat> you might talk just a little bit about the book that you're working on now, the, a biography, obviously. And just... I think we just got disconnected. Really? Yeah, I do. Oh. Let me see. Oh, there you go. I can are. still hear you. <laughs> yeah, it's about Edna Fischel Gellhorn. It's going to be a harder book to write because I didn't get to, I don't have the chance to talk with her, meet with her. It's all paper and research. But, but she was an early suffragette, right? Suffragist? Oh, so much more than that, yeah. She mm -hmm. died in uh, 1970. Martha Gellhorn was her daughter, and you know, most people know about her. But Edna was the mother, and Edna's mother was the first wave suffragist. But um, yeah, I am writing about it and at it for four years now, and I hope to get it done, God willing, this year. Okay. Do I give anybody yeah. another opportunity? Yeah, to is there close? anyone else um, you have a question for Sharon? If you want to know about Edna, go to the Historical Society's site and, and he and Edna Gell. And okay. Galhorn. Okay. Thank Any you. Questions? Any other questions? 
Well, thank you, Sharon. It's been really, really, really interesting. We appreciate it. Thank you, Madeline. Thank you, Claudia. And thank all of you who came. Welcome. In. I really enjoyed it. I love to talk about Helen. I, she's still with me, you know. How, how long did you spend time with her? How many years were you friends? Uh, uh, friendships develop over time, but I met her in 87, 86, I think. 87. And she died in 1994? 94 January. 94. Not long enough. No. Mm. No, she, no, she, she died. Yeah. Uh, the last thing I, I, I can't wait to go out and get the book. I'm, I'm going to go down to Downtown Book and Toy as soon as I can and, and buy this book. I, it is. It's, I really want to read it. Yeah, it, it is. It's well researched, obviously, and really interesting. So, yeah. If there aren't any left, let CC know. I'll drag some more down there, and you all can get it for ten bucks each. And I'm giving the money to the library. That's right. We appreciate that. I remember when it came out, and people came in asking uh -huh. uh, for it. Yeah. Oh, it people definitely wanted to read it. They yeah. really did. Yeah. It's it's definitely circulates. So. Yeah. I remember before you wrote the book, um, when I started here in 1996, people wanting to know. If, if there was anything about her they were kids were writing reports things like that i remember oh, looking information uh, up and yeah a lot being of glad when there was this this book to offer yeah right, for sure yeah we've been yappy here <laughs> yeah. okay yeah is it over or do we go on yeah well thank, yes, you. thank, thank you. you yes thank you and, and thank you participants too to good night <laughs> i enjoyed it have a good evening stay well be safe okay all of you yes you too Mask good night up. <laughs> yes, right. Stop recording.